Well, kia ora, and welcome to online service. My name's Cameron, I'm the pastor here at Village Baptist, and I'm really glad that you've managed to make your way to be with us today. Today in our gathered service, we're hearing from a couple who have been working overseas for the last three years. And so what that means is that we've got another Sunday, one more, uh, where we're gonna have a slightly different online service uh, to our in-person one. This morning, you'll be hearing from Krista McKirkland, a lecturer at uh, Kerry Bible College, as she shares on the faithfulness of God. But as we begin our service together, would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that even when we are lacking in faith, even when we are unfaithful, that you remain faithful to us, that your love, your mercy, your forgiveness, your grace, it continues to be extended to us. And so we pray that this morning, as we are reminded of your faithfulness, that we will also experience your presence that is love, grace, mercy, forgiveness, and compassion. We pray that also for our friends, our family, and loved ones. May they too experience that same presence today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. 
your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. goodness of God, no I'll sing of the goodness of God. Teratato katoa, onore ki te atua, kororia ki te atua, ko moke moke te maunga, ko Martin te roto. Te nati kotimana me nati hamane oku iwi. Ko Atlanta, Georgia te papakainga ko one hunga aho. Ko Kirby te ingwa fano. Ite taha otoku papa ko uh, Huey Kirby Senior rawa ko Helen Morales oku tupuna. Ite taha otoku mama ko Carolyn Hodo rawa ko Livy Cope oku tupuna. Ko Matthew toku hoaranga tira, ko Rea rawa ko John aku tamariki, ha Krista aho, no reira, tena koto, tena koto, tena tato katoa. Oh, kia ora everyone, uh, my name is Krista um, at Curlin for those of you whom I have not yet had a chance to meet. And it's my joy this morning uh, to meet some of you in this format and those um, whom I already know, you may have heard my pepeha in class or in some other format, um, but wanted to actually kick off um, this message um, with the significance of our genealogy, of where we come from, and how quickly I think sometimes, especially in uh, the story of Jesus's birth, we can brush over uh, the genealogy in Matthew 1, 1 in particular, uh, and just try to get to the content, get to the meat. <laughs> um, and in fact, we can miss uh, the beauty of what's going on in that genealogy, what, what Matthew's doing in particular, this theology of Jesus's whakapapa, where he's coming in human history and who he's come from, uh, not just his, his divine father um, as the second person of the Trinity and coming uh, in this concerted will of the Father and Son and the Spirit, but also the humans that have been in his story. And there's a real hopefulness, I think, for us, um, especially in these tumultuous times, these seasons of uncertainty, um, to remember that God is faithful, God is in control, and that we can have peace, we can have hope uh, because of our faith in the loving kindness of God. And so often those four themes of this Advent season, uh, faith, hope, love, and peace, um, and my hope is today we can just take a quick look at how we see those themes coming out, this character of God coming out through this genealogy in Matthew 1.1. And so I'll have my Bible in front of me. Uh, I'm not used to, to preaching without slides, so <laughs> hopefully this will work. Um, but I figured <clears throat> I'll make it brief. And so hopefully um, you won't get too tired of seeing my face here. Uh, so Matthew 1.1 1, 1 <clears throat> begins like this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I'll go on to that next verse here in just a second, but to Matthew's audience, who would most likely have been a Jewish first century group in an oppressed context, they're oppressed by the Romans. This is now the fourth empire under whom they've been dominated. Here they are awaiting the Messiah, who they're pretty confident is gonna be this political ruler coming with a, a rod of iron to, to free them, to liberate them <clears throat> from their oppressor. And so, so much of what's happening in the, all the gospel accounts is this inversion, really, of so many messianic expectations. And yet at the same time, seeing the sovereignty of God, how God has been moving throughout Israel's history and throughout human history to bring about this Jewish Messiah who will fulfill those expectations, but not always in an expected way. 
And some of that uh, undermining expectations even comes out in those who are included in this genealogy. So for this first century Jewish audience, honestly, David and Abraham wouldn't have been that surprising to have in a, ge in a genealogy, although that is highly significant for Jesus coming out of that line. So the lineage of Abraham and then David for a Jewish audience, remembering really that Abrahamic covenant that was given to Abram back in Genesis 12, hundreds of years prior, where in Genesis 12, the Lord had said to Abram, and this is um, uh, yeah, in, in that section, if you want to look at Genesis 12, it's reiterated again in Genesis 15 and elsewhere. The Lord says to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And through you, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. All the ethnos, all the people groups of the earth will be blessed. And so what we're seeing is Jesus is actually coming along this, this lineage of Abram, who became Abraham, the father of many nations, so that Jesus actually might be a blessing to many nations. And so the rest of the New Testament, so much un of that is unpacking how Jesus is that blessing to all nations and even the, 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 wall, the wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles that are torn down through the very body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so we're seeing that fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. But then we also have this father, David. That's in, in Jesus' genealogy. And David, we also have this beautiful covenant with. And if you don't remember David, he's the king in kind of um, Israel's golden years, kind of the highlight of their, their history, the, the times they would have looked back to with fondness, especially in that first century context under oppression, remembering back when David was king, when it was a golden age for Israel. And remembering that in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 7, 16, God had made a covenant to David saying that, that on David's throne, a king would sit forever. Now, again, messianic expectations. Those first century Jewish listeners to Matthew's gospel, they would have thought to themselves, most likely, well, David's king, it's, it, throne, David's throne is nowhere to be found, and there's definitely not a king seated on it. And yet Matthew here is giving us this theology of Jesus in his genealogy. No, actually, he is that Davidic king. He is that fulfillment of the Davidic covenant that God had made with David, that through him there would continue to be an eternal kingship. And so Jesus epitomizes that kingly line from David. So we have, he's the fulfillment of this blessing to Abram, Genesis 12. And then 2 Samuel, he is the eternal king from David. And then also remembering, while, while Abraham and David, they likely would have brought kind of warm fuzzies to that first century Jewish audience as listeners, um, they also had some baggage in their stories. Um, Abram, you may remember, a couple of times passes off his wife um, as his sister, which was also true. Different time, different period there. But still, <laughs> he passes her off um, as just his sister and allows her to go in to be um, intimate with two different uh, rulers uh, in order that his people might get safe passage through this land. And that backfires significantly. Uh, and so... Sarah, his wife, um, really gets the, the short end of the stick uh, on how Abram treats her. And so he has these, these periods of actual unfaithfulness um, in his own life story. And then similarly with David, and we know that story um, where he sees Bathsheba bathing on her rooftop. Palace would have likely been taller than the surrounding buildings. Rooftops were common places to bathe, uh, where you get a little bit of privacy and be out of the view of most people. And yet David looks on her, desires her, calls her into his chambers um, and, and has his way with her. We don't get much of a commentary on Bathsheba in that story. Um, but what we do know later, because David then to cover up her pregnancy, sends her husband Uriah the Hittite to the front lines of a battle that was raging that David was not a part of when he really should have been out there with his men. And yet here he is um, being unfaithful and uh, committing adultery with Uriah's wife and then sending Uriah off to the front lines to be murdered. He knew that would be the consequence um, and then takes Bathsheba to be his wife. 
And so he has this incredibly sordid history there. And so Nathan, the prophet, um, during David's time, confronts him about this. And he has this parallel story where he says to David, you know, there's this rich guy and he comes uh, to this poor farmer and takes his lamb, this innocent lamb. Uh, and even though the, the rich man had a ton of sheep that he could have, have had for his, his feast, instead goes to this um, poor farmer and takes the one lamb that was his that he loved and slaughters that for his banquet. And David is incensed when he hears this story from Nathan. He says, who is this man? And Nathan says, you are the man. And David is cut to the heart and he is repentant. He is remorseful, which is great, but also murder and adultery, pretty terrible um, actions in his history. Even though this, again, this is the king who is said to be the man after God's own heart, but this sordid history in his own life story. And yet he is here included in the genealogy of Jesus. And so as significant as Abram and David are, Abraham and David are, I actually want us to focus now on the women in this genealogy, which is another just fascinating theology that Matthew is telling implicitly to this first century Jewish audience. So I'll go on and read those verses. Uh, so Matthew 1, starting in verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, Jesse, the father of David, the king. And so again, coming back, the significance of David, this Fakapapa leading up to David's lineage, we have these four women, and these four women, it's interesting, it begs the question, why doesn't Matthew include like Sarah and Rebecca, kind of these more reputable women? Again, Sarah also had some of her own <laughs> issues uh, in not believing that God would bless her with a child, um, even in her old age, but still, and also her treatment of Hagar is pretty insidious, to be honest. Um, but we have actually these other women that have a lot kind of more skeletons in their closet, you might say, that are included in the genealogy of the Messiah. And so it begs this question, why are these women included? And for, for us to really know the significance of these women's stories, I'm just going to walk through those briefly here. So Tamar is mentioned first. So way back during the period of the patriarchs, Tamar was wed to Judah. So Judah was one of the tribes of Israel. He was the, the, the kind of the progenitor of that whole tribe of Israel, um, Judah, the Judahites. Um, he's that father of that tribe. And so he had three sons. His oldest son, he gives to Tamar, who was a Canaanite woman, and he dies. And so then according to that law during that time is then she would be given to the next son, the brother of her first husband, in order to carry on the family line. Well, that second son, Onan, treats her very dishonorably, and he doesn't want to fulfill that uh, kinship redeemer uh, role in giving her a chance to have offspring and continue that family line. So he acts dishonorably toward her, and God actually strikes him dead. You can read about this in the book of Genesis. So what Judah says is, I, I tell you what, Tamar, I'll give you my youngest son when he comes of age. So Judah waits in this widowhood, which again, during that time period, women's status was entirely tied to the men that we were associated with. And so she's in this waiting period, can't be um, with a husband and producing uh, children, especially men, again, patriarchy. Um, that's just part and parcel with that time period. So her status in the meantime is kind of in this limbo state. And so she's waiting for this youngest son to come of age. Well, he comes of age and Judah does not hold true to his word to his commitment to Tamar. And so Tamar makes a very risky move. She dresses herself like a temple prostitute and she goes to the, the city gate where temple prostitutes would congregate and knows that her father-in-law is going to pass by. And he sees her and he she's veiled. He doesn't know who she is. And so he propositions her and, and doesn't actually have payment. And so he gives her his signet and his staff as basically a down payment, collateral. And so um, they do what you do. And then lo and behold, Judah, and then after, after that, Tamar goes back home. Um, she doesn't say anything to anybody as far as we know uh, about what happens. <clears throat> and then she's discovered to be pregnant sometime later. So Judah calls her before uh, the family and says, you have, you've, 
been, yeah, you've been immoral. Um, and we're going to burn you alive. Again, just different, <laughs> different time period. This is not just because it's described doesn't mean it's prescribed in scripture. That's something we also have to disentangle a little bit interpretively. Um, and so Tamar then says, well, uh, sure, but whoever has these, whosoever these belong to, that's actually the dad of, of my child. And she produces the signet and the staff from Judah. And Judah in that time recognizes and says publicly, she has acted more honorably than I have because he knew he had promised his youngest to her and then didn't follow through with his word. And yet Tamar, through a pretty bold turn of events, knowing I, that it would cost her her life potentially, um, actually is honored in that setting. And then here she is mentioned in the very genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. Moving down then uh, from Tamar, <clears throat> we have a couple of other women that might be a little bit more familiar to us. Genesis 38, if you want to read more on Tamar's story, feel free when you have time. Uh, but then we have Rahab, and Rahab also a Canaanite prostitute. And this isn't just a one-time thing for Rahab. That's actually her, her vocation. That's her profession in the town of Jericho. And so when Joshua and Caleb and the other spies from Israel after the desert or during the desert wanderings um, after Israel had come out of Egypt, they're trying to scope out the land. And uh, in this territory, and so Rahab actually hides Joshua and Caleb on her roof from the soldiers in Jericho and says, hey, I know about your God and our hearts melt with fear because we know about the power of your God. Please preserve me and my family. And Joshua and Caleb say, we will preserve you and your household, um, especially for your faithfulness to us and, and saving our lives. And then they go back to Israel and then Jericho is conquered. But Rahab and her family are preserved. They are saved through that conquest. And again, this raises other issues on the conquest stories. That's a whole other, that's a sermon series, not just a sermon to talk about that. But regardless, what we get in that story is Rahab, a Canaanite, is faithful and God preserves her. God recognizes faithfulness wherever it is found. And she is included in the genealogy of Jesus. And so then we move on and we get Ruth. Ruth, a Moabite woman. So Naomi, who had been, she's an Israelite, she has Israelite sons, travels out of Israel because of a famine. Her sons um, marry two Moabite women. <clears throat> Ruth is one of those. And then those sons die. And Naomi is bereft and wants to go back to her people. And so Ruth, who's still a young woman, could have stayed with her own kin group. That would have been quite typical. During that time, she would have been far more protected staying with her own kin group. But she says to Naomi, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God, and I will go wherever you go. And her love for Naomi in that book is called chesed, chesed love, which actually is the word used for God's covenant faithfulness love toward Israel. It's that same sense of unconditional dedication. And so Ruth actually comes back with Naomi to Israel. And that's where Boaz, she and Boaz, um, through a whole other series of events, which is a really beautiful story, but Ruth's faithfulness as a non-Israelite leads to she and Boaz coming together, and then she then is in the line of Jesus. <laughs> and so we have Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and then a little bit farther on, um, ah, I forgot this next verse, the end of verse six. So in Jesse is the father of David the king. We know that's come from Ruth. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And so the wife of Uriah, also just an interesting way to, t to say Bathsheba's name. And there's, again, scholars have debated why is it wife of Uriah and not Bathsheba explicitly. And there's a few different ideas here. It could be that there's some shame associated with mentioning Bathsheba in the lineage. But given the women we've already mentioned and their stories, especially Tamar and Rahab, that actually doesn't seem too likely. Instead, what's probably going on here is to, to emphasize Uriah the Hittite, the one who acted so faithfully in contrast to David's faithlessness. And so while we look at these women and we can see one, there's this, this thread of Gentile inclusion in the family of God, which harkens back to that Abrahamic covenant that through Jesus, all nations would be blessed. And what we're even seeing is through the nations, Jesus is even coming to be in his humanity. God is even using the nations in bringing about the birth of his son, which again, still the eternal the second person of the Trinity united to the human nature of Jesus of Nazareth with his birth out of Mary in that first century, but using human beings and messy human beings at that 
to bring about his birth. And so this this Gentile component that we're seeing with Tamar and Rahab and Ruth, possibly Bathsheba, we just don't know. That's that's already an interesting uh, component in the story. But one of the one of the other interpretations has been that not only are these women Gentile or even sexually suspect, having these um, kind of sexual questions around uh, their their lives, but we also have this this juxtapositioning between the faithful Gentile and the faithless. Israelite, God's chosen people, that God is still working in spite of Israel's faithlessness. And so the fact that you have these women kind of spanning the scope of Israel's history. So you have the patriarch period, the patriarchal period with Tamar. We have the period of the conquests with Rahab before Israel's in the promised land. And then we have the period of the judges. So Ruth, the book of Ruth, is actually written at the same time. It's contemporaneous with the book of Judges. And if you get to the end of Judge, you get to the end of Ruth, and it's this, this little genealogy of how she's in the line of David. At the end of Judges, Judges 19, it's not even one I'd want to discuss knowing children are present. Um, for this, uh, this sermon, it is just harrowing to see the depth of depravity of Israel by the book, by the book's end, the end of Judges. And that you have, again, this juxtapositioning between the faithful Moabite Ruth, who has this whole book dedicated to her, and then the faithlessness of the Israelites who had this cycle um, throughout the Judges of sp- kind of crying out and then spiraling down and then being redeemed and then going into depravity and crying out and spiraling down and just over and over and over again as they wait for um, a king, which God also says, the king's not going to fix your problems. <laughs> uh, you're going to regret that ultimately. Um, but if that's what you want to be like the other nations, I'll acquiesce. And so then we actually get that last name, Bathsheba, or the wife of Uriah, during the period of the kings, the monarchic period. But each of those juxtaposed the faithful Gentile, uh, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Uriah the Hittite, with the faithless Israelites, uh, Judah, Israel with Rahab, Israel with Ruth, uh, and then David with Bathsheba. And so this contrast that's going on, and it's not a contrast to, to shame Israel, but in fact, it's a, it's a contrast to show Israel that God is still for them. God is still for us, despite our faithlessness. And that's really what I want us to just conclude with um, today is that God is faithful to Israel despite their faithlessness. God rewards faithfulness wherever it is found. And God also continues to include peoples who we don't really think should be that deserving. (laughs) We can often be pretty pharisaical in who we think is in and who we think is out in God's plan. But recognizing God invites all of us into this story. And also, this is really significant. You'll notice that even in my own pepeha, I'm not... I'm not actually tracing it back to Abraham. Um, I, and, and I didn't really do a spiritual genealogy, but if I were to include in my Pepeha spiritual genealogy, I have Christ in that genealogy because I'm not Jewish by blood. I can't hearken back to Abram uh, by, by lineage. But what Jesus does is he grafts us in to the spiritual family, the, the, the Jewish family. That's what John 15 is talking about, right? We have been grafted in. It's the scandal of the Gentile inclusion. And I think during these times, which honestly, they're so controversial right now, it's just exhausting, right? Um, these have been a tough couple of years. But what I'm hoping is in the midst of seeing this genealogy that spanned hundreds and hundreds of years, that even when our lives are uncertain. And even when we're making major missteps and we're not getting it right, (laughs) that we can actually come back to knowing we have a faithful God. And we can cry out and say, Lord, help us. Help us in our weakness. Strengthen us. Help us to treat our brothers and sisters with whom we, we disagree. As sacred siblings, we are in this genealogy together. And that doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean we can just sit around and sing Kumbaya, but I do think it means we need to come back to who we are as the people of God and also remembering who that God is. This is a God who is faithful, who loves us, 
and on that basis gives us peace in the midst of very unpeaceful times.
Well, that brings us to the end of today's service. Thank you for joining us. If there's something going on in your world and that we can pray with you or, or support you through, please make contact with the church office. We'd love to help you as we can. But as you go into the rest of the week, I pray that you go into whatever it holds with the blessings of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.